listen to Jesus. And the Pharisees and the scribes were grumbling and saying, This fellow welcomes sinners and eats with them. And so he told them this parable. Which one of you, having a hundred sheep and losing one of them, does not leave the ninety-nine in the wilderness and go after the one that is lost until he finds it? And when he has found it, he lays it on his shoulders and rejoices. And when he comes home, he calls together his friends and neighbors, saying to them, Rejoice with me, for I have found my sheep that was lost. Just so, I tell you, there will be more joy in heaven over one sinner who repents than over ninety-nine righteous persons who need no repentance. Or what woman, having ten silver coins, if she loses one of them, does not light a lamp, sweep the house, and search carefully until she finds it? And when she is found, she calls together her friends and neighbors, saying, Rejoice with me, for I have found the coin that I have lost. Just so I tell you, there is joy in the presence of the angels of God over one sinner who repents. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. You may be seated and let us pray. Father God in heaven, we thank you for your words of saving grace this day. We thank you, Lord, for the understanding of what lostness means and what being found by you and your grace and your love means to us. Lord God, let's not make lostness and sin necessarily synonymous, but understand the difference between the two. Because Lord, no matter who we are, among good people, wrong people, or in between, we always find our lostness in you, and you always find us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. There's a story told of a pastor who died, and he was waiting in line at the pearly gates. And ahead of him was a guy who was dressed in sunglasses, a loud shirt, a leather jacket, and jeans. And St. Peter addressed the, the guy and said, Who are you, so that I may know whether or not to admit you into the kingdom of heaven? And the guy replied, I'm Joe Cohen, a taxi driver in New York City. And St. Peter consulted his list, and he smiled and said, Take this silk robe and this golden staff and enter the kingdom of heaven. The taxi driver went into heaven, and then it was the pastor's turn. And he stood erect, and he boomed out, I am Joseph Snow, pastor of St. Mary's Church for the past 43 years. And St. Peter consulted his list and said to the pastor, Take this cotton robe and this wooden staff and enter the kingdom of heaven. Just a minute, said the pastor. The taxi driver who just entered heaven before me, why does he get a silk robe and a wooden staff while I just get a cotton robe and a wooden staff? How can that be? And St. Peter said, well, up here we work by results. While you preached, people slept. While this taxi driver drove, people prayed. <laughs> well, in today's gospel, we learn that Jesus' ministry showed results. Amen? Amen. And we also learn about the challenging kind of people who Jesus hung around with. Those who perhaps were ready to hear his invitation to enter the kingdom of heaven. And yes, these individuals included tax collectors and sinners. So, if you would be so kind, turn to page 12, and I want you to read with me the very first two verses of our gospel today. It's found on page 12. Just read the first two verses. These, these words are very telling to us. Let's read the first two verses together. Now all the tax collectors and sinners were coming here to listen to Jesus. And the Pharisees and the scribes were grumbling and saying, this fellow welcomes sinners and eats with them. Well, you know, on one level, the words of the Pharisees and the scribes are simply a statement of fact. That's what Jesus did. And the Gospels of Matthew, Mark, and Luke, they tell us the same thing. Jesus ministered to, and he ate with the tax collectors and the sinners. But at another level, the words of the Pharisees and scribes speak, they are words of accusation, an indictment, if you will, and a judgment. In the eyes of the words of the Pharisees and scribes, 
Jesus is guilty of violating the law and social norms of the day. At the deepest level, however, the words of the Pharisees and the scribes, the words that they speak, ironically enough, are actually a statement of the gospel. They have just actually spoken the good news. Jesus not only welcomes the sinners, he eats with them. And eating with them means there is relationship and acceptance of these individuals by Jesus. <clears throat> Jesus has aligned himself with the tax collectors and the sinners. He is on their side. So, how do these words, Jesus welcoming and eating with the tax collectors and the sinners, how do those words strike you this morning? What do you hear in those words? Are those words words of complaint and disagreement or ones of hope and invitation? The fact is, throughout all the gospel stories, Jesus chooses to hang out with the wrong kind of people. The tax collectors, the prostitutes, the sinners, the downtrodden. And that's why in today's gospel, the tax collectors and sinners were coming here to listen to Jesus because he offered them something that no one else could or would. And that's also why the Pharisees and scribes were grumbling. Jesus was breaking the law crossing the lines and making God just a little too easily accessible to these so-called bad people. And I wonder if the fact that Jesus chooses to hang out with these wrong kind of people, that may be why some of us sitting here this morning may not hear the good news in these words that are spoken by the Pharisees and the scribes. This this fellow welcomes sinners and he eats with them. You see, the difficulty for most of us is that we don't see ourselves as wrong people. The wrong kind of people. And to the contrary, true, we try to really hard to be good people. The right kind of people. And sure, there are times when we mess up. We do not say the right things. Sometimes we are guilty. But generally, we behave and do what's right, or at least we try to. We look, we speak, we act the part that's expected of us. We love our spouse and our children. We are honest in our business dealings. We are kind and friendly to each other. We work hard, we provide for our families, and we help our friends. We support our troops and we pledge our allegiance to the flag. We come to church on Sunday morning, we say our prayers. We care about the poor. We donate time and money and food and clothes to those in need. So I'm not suggesting that all of us here this morning should be the wrong kind of people, whatever that might mean to be the wrong kind of people. But I am suggesting we need a different starting point, not only for ourselves, but for each other. The starting point for Jesus is grace, searching, not blaming. Finding, not punishing. Rejoicing, not condemning. And the first question for Jesus is not one of sin. Who gets a dinner invitation and who does not? Who gets into heaven and who does not? For Jesus, everyone is already in. Everyone is invited. The first question and a primary concern is one of presence. Have we shown up? Or are we lost and still missing? Allow me to explain. It seems that for many, maybe most of us, sin is some kind of legal category that primarily is restricted to and declarative of physical behaviors about others rather than the descriptive condition of our own relationships that exist in everyone, including ourselves. And so when we hear folks from both sides of the table in Washington, D.C. say, we can't let these bad, bad people come into our country. Please tell me who among us is void of some, having some bad in us. It's part of our human condition. As St. Paul says in the book of Romans, who among us has not fallen short of the glory of God? Amen? Amen. It's easy for us to cast others as being sinful as a description of how we see and judge other people rather than a diagnosis that exists among all God's people, including ourselves. 
That's why it's often hard for us to hear these words, this fellow welcome sinners and eats with, with them. We have a hard time hearing good news in those words and to rejoice at the meals that Christ offers and shares with sinners and tax collectors. You see, the bottom line is we often don't think about sin. It's about us. Compared to, quote, unquote, those kind of people. We think we're pretty good. And so did the Pharisees and the scribes in the same way, thinking that they were pretty good people, that they got it together. For Jesus, however, the defining characteristic of sin is not physical misbehavior, per se, but being lost. And notice the parables that Jesus offers. They're not about being wrong. They're about being lost. A sheep is lost. A coin is lost. There's nothing about culpability or blame or finding fault. Now that doesn't mean to think that this is something that doesn't concern Jesus because it does. His concern though is for the one that is lost and missing and absent. Jesus doesn't explain how the lost becomes lost. He does not blame or judge the one who is lost. That's not the issue. The issue for Jesus is recovering from and reclaiming the loss. The lostness that I said before is part of every one of our human conditions. No doubt we can be lost in the darkness of evil. And we can, and have throughout human history, done wrong things to one another. No question about it. Nobody will argue the point. But here's the deal. We can also be really, really good people at the same time and still really, really lost. Think about it. We can be good, hardworking, and successful in our career and still feel lost without a true sense of direction or meaning in life. We can be holding it all together and still be lost in the depths of grief or despair. We can be a good spouse doing all the right things, giving all the right appearances, and still be lost in a loveless marriage. We can have a good reputation and still be lost in questions about our own identity and our purpose. We can be so busy and productive that we are lost to the wonder and the beauty of the mystery of life. We can be financially secure and still be lost in fear. We can say and do all the right things, but be lost in a secret life that is self-destructive, that is hurting us and hurting other people we care about. So you see in today's gospel, Jesus has enlarged the definition of sin. And he has expanded the purview of grace. The Pharisees and scribes want to make it all about behavior of the sinners and the tax collectors. They're bad, bad people. Don't speak to them, Jesus. Keep them out. And that happens whenever sin is defined as only a legal category, a failed or apparent behavior. Jesus, however, makes it about God's character. And that's the point of these two parables told in our gospel today. These two parables are about the lost sheep and the lost coin. But they also reveal God's character, God's grace, God's way of being toward us, revealed in and through Jesus. And how God wants to reveal God's character in us. So just as God has found us, we might want to find one another. The grace and character of God are revealed in Jesus in three ways. Searching, finding, and rejoicing. Those are not three different things. They are not three separate actions or moments in time. But they are three manifestations of God's one grace. They are the ongoing presence of God in Christ in each one of our lives. And when we are out there in the world taking care of God's business in our personal lives, and when we are being about the business of God in this St. Mark's Lutheran Church, we're searching for the lost. We're about the business of God in finding the lost. 
We're about the business of God and rejoicing when the lost are found. And depending on what our circumstances may be in our lives, we experience God's grace in different ways on our different journeys. The point is we matter to God. We all matter to God. We are desired by Him. This spouse of Jesus who welcomes sinners and eats with them is constantly searching for us. He is constantly finding us in our losses. He is constantly rejoicing over our presence when we come to this table. This fellow Jesus who welcomes sinners and eats with them, this fellow who is searching for us, finding us, and rejoicing over our presence is Jesus Christ. Today, let's commit ourselves to that same kind of God's character that God bestows upon us and that's always bestowed upon us. That we as individuals and as a church may be out there in the world searching and finding and rejoicing over all the people who are present in this Coral Gables community, welcoming them to the table of the Lord, the table where all are welcome, today, now, and forevermore. And as God's people together, we say, Amen. Amen. The congregation, please stand. And may the peace of God, which passes all human understanding, keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus our Lord.